Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. This is Seven Steps to Successful Self-Publishing in 2016. Uh, Joanna, maybe you would like to share your screen and get your opening slide up there. Yeah, I think you have to change presenter. Uh, again, eh? <laughs> okay, I can do that. I know how to do that. Uh, okay. You know, we we'll go. figure all this software out eventually, <laughs> folks. Now, That's what's most, fun about live events. Most people here already know Joanna Penn, but Joanna is a New York Times and USA Today best-selling author. She's also a podcaster with uh, several hundred episodes of her fantastic podcast. I highly recommend it. It's not only educational, but it's fun every time you listen. And, uh, of course, Joanna is also uh, known by most people through her blog at thecreativepen.com. Joanna writes and publishes both fiction and nonfiction successfully. And that's one of the reasons why I think this webinar is going to be especially interesting to authors. So without wasting any more of your time, I'm going to turn it over to Joanna. Uh, Joanna, take it away. Thanks so much for having me, Joel. And you can see my screen right now. Perfect. You're all good. Okay, well, welcome again, everybody. And uh, I just wanted to sort of emphasize again that this evening I'll be talking about fiction and nonfiction because I write both. And I'll also be talking a bit about branding because it's something I've tackled myself between nonfiction and fiction as I write under two different names, although you can pretty much tell who I am. I left my day job uh, as an IT consultant in September 2011, and uh, I am a full time, I make a full time living with my writing. And uh, as you can see, you've sold quite a few books now in quite a few countries in lots of different formats uh, and all without a publisher. So that's the most important thing for our session today. I make my living with self-publishing. But in case that is worrying you and you're like, uh, that's a bit much for me. This is me back in 2008, and uh, I like this picture because uh, look at the view, look at my eyes there. I do not have a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> that is basically the look of hope. This is a this is my first book, and it's just going to change everybody's life. And that's pretty much what I thought back in 2008. I thought that oh, you just wrote a book and then you printed a ton of them, as you can see there. I printed quite a lot of books, and uh, most of those went in the landfill. So we we, we were We'll be talking about um, print on demand as we go through. But essentially, I knew very little back in 2008. I made a lot of mistakes. So what I'm talking about today is a lot of what I've learned uh, along the journey from that first book to where I am today. So I hope that encourages you in terms of what you can achieve if you want to, uh, to go far with your book. But it's all about you today. So how can you successfully self-publish in 2016? And of course, I had to boil it down to seven steps. <laughs> so we'll get straight into it. So the first one is decide on your definition of success. And this is so important because how can you be successful in self-publishing unless you know what success means? So here are some examples of what success could mean to you. So first of all, that's me with my dad. Um, on his 65th birthday, I helped him self-publish his first and only book, Nada. And that's us there with the champagne and his book. So for some people, successful self-publishing is holding a book, uh, you know, your own book in your hand, uh, as we did there with my dad's book. The second one might be to, you know, be on a front table at Barnes & Noble or be in every Barnes & Noble in the country. It might be number one on the entire Amazon store. Or it might be E.L. James, 95 million. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most people wouldn't turn that down, uh, even given the notoriety of those books. Uh, or the Man Booker Prize or a Literary Prize or the New York Times list, for example. And uh, I, you know, I've been on the New York Times and the USA Today list, and it is one of those things that a lot of authors want. Uh, I personally would rather have the 95 million than the Literary Prize, but you will have to decide that for yourself. So the first thing, this is so, so important because you can't use somebody else's definition of success. And also it will be different for this book. 
So I know we have on the line people who are writing their first book this year. So your, your success will be different to the uh, lady who's already on her fifth self-published book. And your goalposts will change, I guarantee it, to mind you all the time. And your decisions around definition of success will shape how you write how you publish and how you market. So it's really important to understand that straight up. So write it down. And then of course it, it, it will be really easy very quickly if your definition of success is to hold your book in your hand then just go to createspace.com and print one copy and uh, using print on demand you don't it won't be very expensive don't make the mistake I did and print thousands and thousands of books uh, if you want to win a literary prize I would suggest that you look at getting an agent and a publishing deal because although you can do it as a self-published author it's very very hard so I'm going to assume for the rest of this presentation presentation that your definition of success involves selling books, reaching readers, uh, helping people, changing lives, which many non-fiction authors particularly want, um, and also making a good income or, in brackets, a very good income. So I hope that uh, you feel you're in the right place and that that is part of your definition of success. So that's what you need to do straight out the gate. The second thing is to sort out your writing process. Now I know this is about successful self-publishing, but one of the most important things about publishing is of course having the book done. And I wanted to, to tackle this because uh, you know the, the, there have been all sorts of sort of New Year's resolution posts from big name bloggers recently, and they all focus on the fundamentals of this uh, life, which is the writing. <laughs> and especially if you're doing your first book and you're wanting to put that out, finishing the book is the most important thing. And if you want to be successful self-publisher and make more money, then your writing is actually super important. So these are some of the, the tips that I have for getting your writing schedule sorted. Uh, and again, I, always, I think it's schedule, the Americans say, or something. But the first thing is to actually write down your writing times as you would any other business meeting. So, for example, you know, I know a lot of parents will put their children's you know, play dates and clubs and things in the diary, but they won't schedule their own uh, writing time. So that would be my number one thing, is actually schedule that time as you would any other business or personal meeting. The second one is to use timed writing. Now, using timed writing changed my life. It really did. So saying, OK, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to do 15 minutes, no Facebook, no nothing. I'm just going to write and get it done. And this is how uh, I'm writing book number 18 at the moment. And this, seriously, is the number one tip. And the second one is setting word counts. So you can either set those word counts around your timed writing or around daily word count. Now, when I was doing my first book, I think it probably was only about 250 words a day that I managed uh, most days before work when I used to get up at sort of 5 a.m. But getting any kind of word count done is super important. And then also setting deadlines, and this is important for self-publishing as well, because when you're in charge of all your deadlines yourself, you actually have to book things in advance. So for example, you will have to book your editor. So you need to know when you're going to finish that first draft. Uh, you might, if you're more established, set a pre-order date. So uh, Indies can now do pre-orders on most of the big platforms. So I've uh, my next book, Destroyer of Worlds, is out on the 31st of March, <laughs> which, uh, considering I'm only 15,000 words into the book, means I need to get a move on, you know, to get it to my editor. So that type of thing. So sorting out your writing process is the way that you're going to be more successful at the self-publishing journey altogether. The other thing is be accountable. Pardon me. <laughs> if you uh, are on your first book, then it's super important to finish that book. It's a sort of guiding principle of writing is to finish that book. Don't give up on it. Um, even if you don't end up publishing that first book, by finishing it, you will prove to yourself that you can write a book. Then the process of publishing actually is not that big a deal once you get used to it. The most time that you will spend will be in writing and in marketing. The publishing bit doesn't take very long. I also wanted to mention this brilliant book, The Pursuit of Perfection and How It Harms Writers by Christine Catherine Rush. Because I meet a lot of authors and I talk to a lot of authors and this 
this pursuit of perfection, this editing and re-editing and rewriting and rewriting the same book for years and years is what stops people moving on and getting out there and being successful at self-publishing. Because uh, as we go through, you'll see some of the mistakes I've made. Um, and jo Joel's not known me for years now, so uh, he'll remember some of this. But uh, you, you basically have to get going. So be accountable to yourself. Be accountable to your future readers or the readers you already have. And uh, get on with it and sort out your writing process. That is super important. Okay, so getting more into the sort of publishing nitty gritty, it's you have to understand your target market to be successful. Now, you this is where you have to switch your head. So imagine you're kind of rotating your body 180 degrees, and now you're looking at yourself. Um, you are, you know, you are often your target market. So, for example, I have on my desk here a big the doorstop edition of The Stand by Stephen King uh, because. You know, I love reading Stephen King and many of my books are suitable for his readers. So I study him and I learn about him and people who like his books. So it's very important to consider that not, not the whole world wants your book. And in fact, the, more, the smaller market you aim for, the more likely you will hit it. But that can be very difficult, I realize that, especially if it's your first book. It's really super hard. So here's some help. First of all, forget demographics. I really think, you know, women aged 45 to 70 who live in Atlanta uh, is kind of a useless thing. It's more about, you know, as I just said about Stephen King, some of you will, in your mind, will be going, oh, I like Stephen King as well. Or as I've got on the screen here, George R. R. Martin, uh, you know, if you like the Game of Thrones books and the, the TV show and everything, then you'll recognize this type of book cover, uh, swords and uh, dragons and things like that. So don't think about demographic, demographics, uh, think more about readers who like this also like that. So I often say my arcane series is Dan Brown meets Lara Croft, and that will bring up images in your head. You know, if you liked the Angelina Jolie, uh, Lara Croft sort of thing, um, you know, this is going to be archaeology, this is going to be conspiracy, that type of thing. And that, in your, again, in your mind, you will either go, yes, that sounds great, or no, that sounds terrible. <laughs> um, so it's really important to consider this more psychographic approach to who will like your book. And this will really, really help you down the line. It will help you with book covers, it will help you with book bloggers, it will help help you with the marketing, it will help you with so much. And I find that keeping a list, and this is especially hard for fiction authors, uh, keep a running list of the books that you love to read, um, especially if you're cross-genre, because over time it will help you narrow people down by these psychographic um, things. Uh, and uh, again, do that separately for fiction and non-fiction. You might even be doing this already on a site like Goodreads or maybe you uh, review books on your blog, things like that. So that's, that's a first start. Think about more of those uh, psychographic areas. And then to find out sort of more similar books in that uh, genre, then uh, what I do is I actually Google book bloggers and the name of the book or the, um, you know, the, the other things that they review to try and find books that are in the similar vein. Because let's face it, it's very difficult to compare your book to Stephen King. <laughs> One, he writes across multiple genres. Or, you know, George R. R. Martin, you immediately sound like an idiot when you compare yourself to these big names. So having a look, uh, if you Google, let's just keep using Stephen King, if you Google Stephen King, The Shining Review, I mean, that's an old book now, or uh, Doctor Sleep, for example, which is more recent, and have a look at what else that book blogger has reviewed. Chances are they're the type of person that you can look at later in terms of marketing and submit your book to them. But it will also help you think about book covers, which we're going to come on to, because book covers are so important for indies. So here's a few examples on the screen. It's very important to make it obvious <laughs> what genre your book is. So of course the uh, attractive torso with tattoo um, is a, a nice uh, romance trope. Uh, scattered sons, you know, very sci-fi and their fully raw diet. I mean, just make it obvious. <laughs> if you're doing non-fiction, um, we'll come back to um, non-fiction in a minute actually a bit more detail on that, but what are the expectations of the readers of that genre? 
what do their book covers look like, um, what do they expect from a book. So a romance book, for example, you know, the two people have to end up together. Uh, if it's an erotica, that obviously has to be sex in it. So, um, you know, where a sweet romance might not have any. In my type of thrillers, action adventure, there's pretty much never any sex. It just goes on behind the screens. But there's a lot of fight scenes, for example. So think about the genre expectations. If it's a non-fiction book, uh, you know, they're the fully raw diet. It's quite obvious <laughs> what should be in that book and what will satisfy the reader. So. This, I, I thought I'd fess up and uh, again, I hope this will help you as uh, new authors if you're just starting out or even more established authors. So um, the, uh, the first three books there, Pentecost, Prophecy, Exodus, are the, my first three novels and uh, basically 2011, 2012, 2013 because at the beginning it took me about a year to write and publish a book. But I, with those books, and I have a master's degree in theology, but I'm not a Christian. So what had happened is I love these titles, I still love the titles, but they were attracting the, or they gave the impression of the wrong type of book. Whereas to give a more Dan Brown kind of action adventure book, um, I rebranded uh, earlier last year as Stone of Fire, Crypt of Bone and Ark of Blood. And you can see the new covers there for the new look. And so I, the reason I share this is because it's okay <laughs> if you don't understand your own brand at the beginning, <laughs> if you don't understand where you fit in the world, in the publishing ecosystem. You can change it later. You can change book titles, you can change covers all you like. Um, that's not a big deal. So I hope that encourages you around understanding your market. It, you can change over time. I also wanted to point out uh, these books by H.M. Ward, who is one of the best-selling indie authors, uh, has sold over 10 million copies, she's just, she's just incredible. But what is interesting is originally her books weren't going anywhere. <laughs> and you can see there um, the original books, Secrets and Scandalous, a kind of artistic-y look, commercial women's, but if you look at the new covers, the romance covers, and if you look at H.M. Um, Ward's covers now, they are very clearly uh, you know, romance erotica books. And uh, you can see there, this is um, screen prints from a, a blog post she did on Goodreads that essentially by changing those things, she um, hit the New York Times list and basically hasn't stopped. The, the content of the book hasn't changed, but the understanding of her genre and the understanding of her audience has changed. So she's learned about her target market and has learned shorthand for how to show that target market, you know, what the hell is in the book. And this is why having books that people recognize by their cover is so important. It's one of the number one marketing things that we have. And it's basically part of the self-publishing process. You need a book cover <laughs> to publish your book. And I think this is something I learn more and more all the time. And uh, the importance of the book cover is just incredible. That okay. is a fantastic oh. uh, demonstration, by the way, Joanna. Uh, oh, I'm glad because you, I mean, you're the book cover man. These covers are, I mean, the two romance covers, the new ones, you know, just they tell you instantly from across the room what kind of book it is. You know, no matter how beautiful the paintings, uh, the illustrations were for the old books, they really weren't doing the job for the book or the author. They, you know, although they're pretty they weren't really telling you much about what kind of book it was. So I think that's brilliant. And I really want to thank you for bringing this to people's attention. Oh, thanks, Joel. And of course, uh, on the bookdesign.com every month, you can browse the, it's one of my kind of not very guilty pleasures is browsing the ebook cover awards and looking at Joel's comments, some of which are, um, you know, quite harsh, let's face it. <laughs> but well, I'm trying to keep the snark to a minimum, but I mean, you know, if you have to look at thousands of these covers all the time, and you know. It is. It's <laughs> I, I want people it, yeah. to get better. That's what I, that's what's driving me. Anyway, back to you. Oh, exactly. Sorry. Yes, no, exactly. But I think I think that this importance of understanding your target market is ultimately reflected in the cover. And I guess the main thing again is to remember that you can change things later and it's just shorthand. Okay, so the next thing, and remember, um, 
I am absolutely focusing on you should write the book that you love um, and if your definition of success is just finishing the book and getting it out there then brilliant but if we take it further and say that you actually want to sell books and you actually want to make money then the next um, one on our list is write books that people actually want <laughs> and this this um, some people take I guess the wrong way but I'm really saying write at the intersection of what you love and what might sell now I don't write um, romance. I, you know, sometimes I wish I could because it's, you know, it's a, a lot of romance writers do very well. But I don't read romance. I actually read, you know, thrillers. I read horror. Um, I read paranormal, that type of thing. And so I am always going to write based on what I love. However, I also read um, travel memoir. Um, you know, I would like to write a travel memoir. I'd like to write some kind of spiritual book. But those books are on the back burner because at the moment I'm focusing on making a living with my writing and uh, with my self-publishing. So I'm sticking in the genre fiction for my um, thrillers and uh, for my non-fiction I write books that fit with my market. Um, and I will absolutely branch out into other things. But it's really important to have a look at the author earnings reports and have a look at the genre reports and also have a look at the top, you know, the top 100, drill down into the categories on Amazon, look at the top books there, spend some time on the USA Today list, the Sunday Times list in the UK or whichever country you're in, um, have a look at the top sellers and you know, start looking at things with a different eye, looking at it from a, okay, if I want to be successful in science fiction or I want to be successful in entrepreneurship or in, you know, in this part of cookery, what you know what do I need to do and in fact even if I am successful in this genre what is the what could what could I actually sell you know is is this like hit you can see here that um, graphic novels are still a very small part of the ebook market and of course they're very expensive to print so at the moment um, graphic novels I think are just beginning to take off in in the digital space on Amazon because they now have a specific comic publishing platform which is brilliant the same with children's books but right now the biggest sellers are romance I think romance is something like 40% of ebooks sold so it's important to look at what you read what are your favorite books and as I mentioned um, the stand is on my desk because it, it is my favorite book and I'm trying to understand why you know break down the, the best-selling books in your genre and see how that helps you with your books so then the next thing that's you know that is more for fiction for non-fiction this is the important thing <laughs> and again um, these are the the uh, ultimate the change I made to um, how to enjoy your job if you think back to the original slide I put up on the screen where there was little me in my pinstripe suit when I used to wear such things um, holding a book which was called how to enjoy your job or find a new one now you can see there the middle cover was when I got the cover redesigned but it didn't change the title and then the third change was to actually change the title based on keywords because if um, and in fact my book should be number one or two on Amazon if you go to Amazon and search career change my book should be number one or two and every January I get a nice uh, spike of sales because people are actually searching now this is a top tip for non-fiction uh, authors write a book with a title that people are actually searching for <laughs> so you can see here exactly how to do this essentially you go onto Amazon now go onto the store that you're aiming for so if you're writing in German you know you want to sell in Germany go to amazon.de or you know um, amazon.com.au um, I was always aiming to sell in America and um, probably 80% of my income comes from the US even though I'm in the UK so given that the US is the biggest market uh, in the world right now for uh, e-commerce <laughs> and certainly ebooks in English it, it's a very good idea to do your research on amazon.com even if you're not in America so uh, go into the Amazon search bar go to the Kindle store and start typing in uh, things <laughs> whatever you whatever relates to your topic area and then what I tend to do is just um, go through the alphabet so um, 
how to be an A, how to be a B, how to be a C, how to be a D, and see what comes up, and it will just give you some ideas. Or um, paranormal A, paranormal B, etc. And you will find a whole load of things that are really, really interesting. Or gluten-free A, you know, that type of thing. And that is a really good um, way to brainstorm book titles, but also keywords which go into your self-publishing screen. Now, of course, um, I don't have uh, time to show you all the screen prints of publishing on Amazon, um, but you will need these types of keywords um, for publishing on the different stores. And the main thing is really to consider Amazon and the other stores as a search engine. Amazon primarily, as the others have a lot of merchandising. And the categories, as we said, like the genre, genre is basically a category now or a subcategory on Amazon. And the keywords like these, so how to be a celebrity is one keyword phrase. Uh, basically, it's not five keywords. And that's a really important point because you get seven keywords or keyword phrases when you self-publish. So you can actually use these keywords to get into more categories, which is super exciting. Uh, so you only get two categories when you self-publish, but if you use different um, keywords, you can get in a whole lot more. So I've used my free book, Stone of Fire, my perma-free, the first in my series. Um, and you can see at the bottom the list of keywords that I've used, and there are seven, even though one of them is supernatural mystery action thriller series. <laughs> that is one keyword. Um, and you can see there that I've used conspiracy thriller, men's adventure, and women's adventure, and uh, also supernatural stuff. So that has got me into um, men's adventure category, women's adventure, conspiracy. This is the way of getting discovered, and getting discovered is one of the most important things in self-publishing success. So making metadata your friend might sound quite scary in a way, because the word metadata is um, might be difficult, but it's essentially the categories, the keywords, um, the things that describe your book that are not the text of your book. And uh, I'm a bit of a futurist. I'm hoping that within a couple of years we'll have really good AI, which will just mean you can load your book up and they will automatically index it for all the right things. But for now, we have to choose things ourselves and categorize things ourselves. So hopefully that will help you with yours and you can use keywords to get into more categories uh, than you could have done otherwise. Okay, so another part of metadata is also the back blurb or the sales page on Amazon. And this, again, is super important for successful self-publishing. And it's very hard. I mean, you think writing your 80,000-word novel is hard or your you know, 60,000-word um, self-help book. Now you have to write a couple of hundred words um, describing your book so that people want to buy it. <laughs> This back blurb or sales description can be super, super hard, and uh, we all struggle with it. But again, one of the great benefits of self-publishing is being able to update things over time. So uh, many of us change our um, description quite a lot over time. You know, go in, update it. Uh, if you're doing a sale, you can update it, that type of thing. But in terms of helping you with uh, actually writing yours, uh, there's a couple of tips. So first of all, model successful books. And this is probably one tip in general for life, <laughs> which is model successful books, model successful people. So just, just to digress, if, if you want to, because there's a lot of people with a lot of advice out there, you guys know that, about writing, about self-publishing, about marketing, um, it's very important to listen to people who are doing it in a way that fits with you. <laughs> so listen to people who are having success in an area you want to have success. So if you want to sell 10 million romance books, go and read H.M. Ward's blog. <laughs> that is super important. Um, yeah, so model successful books, and as we said, you can model successful covers as well. And you can also model back blurbs or sales descriptions. And this is how I started writing mine, was I went to um, you know the category I wanted to rank in, so let's say conspiracy thriller. I went to the top sort of 20 books um, and opened up a Word document, and I just typed out the... Um, I think I did about 15 in the end. I literally just copied them onto the document. Now, uh, this is not. This is also a writing technique. Um, people like Dean Wesley Smith, who's an amazing blogger, recommend typing out passages of other authors' books in order to kind of understand 
let the understanding flow through your fingers type of thing. And uh, this is what I would say to do with the back blurb and the sales page as well. So uh, there's an example on the screen there. Um, and if you've, if you've got, you know, a girl lies close to death. Uh, I've got a thing that's over the screen. I can't really read it. Um, yeah. A driver drags her body to the side of the road, that type of thing. It's a very punchy style of writing. It's hyperbole. It's over the top. There's always a mention of the character. This is for fiction, obviously. Um, for non-fiction, non-fiction, you can include the table of contents. You can emphasize the problem of the customer. Um, but if you write out 15 um, b uh, b book blurb descriptions, you will learn how the publishers do it and do it very well or how other indies do it and you will actually be able to then model that yourself. Now this is not plagiarism at all, this is modeling. Okay, so then you can also use review quotes, you can use keywords within your text, um, you can see there the back road is an electrifying thriller. Um, you know, if you start to actually look at other people's pages, you'll be able to model those and that will help you with yours. Okay, so I hope so far that you're getting the feeling that there's a lot more involved than just uploading your book to uh, multiple stores. And that, that's why I wanted to tackle some uh, slightly different angles, I guess, on the self-publishing success. Because uh, obviously the writing is important, but things like metadata, getting the book right. You know, I haven't mentioned tweeting or blogging or, you know, any of those types of things. Because if you don't get the fundamentals right, then none of that's going to make uh, much difference anyway. And this is definitely something I've learned from the beginning, which, you know, since I started, I guess, when I first self-published my first book, I really just didn't have a clue. And these are the things that I've learned over time are the most important things. So in terms of 2016, this number six is what probably one of the top things, um, which is if you're going to write, write in a series. <laughs> if you want to be successful in terms of sales and reaching readers. And that doesn't necessarily mean a uh, fiction series. I've got there S.J. Scott, who is one of the best-selling non-fiction indie authors who writes um, habits, habit books in a series. So if you buy one book on habits, you'll probably buy another book on habits. Um, the main reason for this is to think about the binge consumption culture. Now, uh, you know, I'm into House of Cards, and w once the whole season drops um, on, I think it's on Netflix, isn't it, whatever it's on, um, in, uh, I think it's March, or when Game of Thrones starts, you know, people want to binge the whole thing. And this is what happens when you have a series. So think about how long it takes you to read a book. It's, it's just not long at all. Um, you know, maybe it takes a couple of hours, maybe it takes a couple of days, but that author might have taken a year to write a book <laughs> and you've just finished it super fast. But if there's a series, then they have something to go to next. And um, I should have put it up here, but there was a survey done by the International Thriller Writers, which said it takes 3.4 books, <laughs> uh, so between three and four books, for a casual reader to become a fan. So if, if you're just a one-hit wonder, um, so I'm picking one, uh, The Girl on the Train, which, you know, everybody's probably heard of now, massive book. Most people will not be a fan of that author. In fact, most people will have heard the title of the book, but will not remember the name of the author um, and uh, may not buy her next book. So it's kind of a one-hit wonder. If it's between three and four books, then people are likely to then become a fan and carry on reading. So having a series that either has a series character or relates to each other in some way is a very good way to um, be successful in self-publishing. So that binge consumption culture, uh, as I said, people who find you at any point, so I'm just writing book eight in my Arcane series, which is at the bottom there, Destroyer of Worlds, and people who discover me at book eight uh, may well go back and buy all of the books. You also don't have to reinvent the characters in the world, so you can write faster. And if you're writing nonfiction, you can chunk your books down into kind of multiple different topics that will hit the same type of um, reader. And also in terms of success, many authors note uh, an income jump at book three. 
and also book five. And uh, if, if part of your definition of success is uh, money, uh, as mine is, definitely happy readers mean, you know, happy income, then um, that's super important as well. You can also put books into box sets um, once you have more than three books. Single author box sets are very profitable on a lot of stores. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. So that, that's one thing is to consider a series um, over time. The other thing is free. Now, many people think that free is over um, or free is just for people in KDP Select, uh, which I'll mention again in a minute. But um, Smashwords end of year survey um, found that series with free starters earn more money than books without free starters. So this is really important and people, uh, you know, I read all the time that people think free is over, but it's definitely not. And BookBub, and if you can't get on BookBub, then free booksy and other uh, free promotional services or books that promote free books um, say that more than 60% of survey res respondents said they've gone on to buy other books written by the same author after downloading a free title. And I've had um, Stone of Fire on Permafree for years now, <laughs> and it still brings in, um, you know, a number of people every single day. Some of those, of course, a lot of those people will never read that free book. Some of them do, and some of them go on to buy the other uh, six books um, or some of my other books. So that is super important to consider as well. And it is also kind of free promotion. Now I know that if you're writing your first book, you will not put that first book for free <laughs> because you will be feeling very attached to that book, um, which is why writing three books and then using free is a better idea. But you can also vary length and price. So consider writing a novella. So again, some of H.M. Ward's books there, or I've got several novellas. My Day of the Vikings, for example, is a novella. Novellas are short, so between 20 and 40,000 words, whereas a full novel might be between 60 and 100K. Uh, you can also do box sets. So once you have more books, you have much more ability to change your length and your price. Okay, so finally, number seven, and uh, one of my favorites, um, because this to me is the one thing, the number one thing, if you want, if, you, if your definition of success is to do this either full time or to have some kind of writing career, um, you know, and you must be just as crazy as me, right, because you love writing and, and this is an, very exciting for you, is to consider multiple streams of income on multiple platforms. So my definition of success uh, over time has kind of morphed into this, um, you know, CEO of a global publishing company. But of course, when you're writing your first book, you might not see it this way, but I wanted to kind of expand your horizons so that you will be excited about what is possible once you have finished that first book. So when you do have a manuscript, it's not just one thing. And this is like when the penny drops on this, it's like a magic moment. Uh, because it's not just one thing. Uh, if you think how many ebook editions there are now, you know, Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Nook, all the different platforms, print edition, audio edition, so that's at least, you know, well, let's just say three for the safe bit, but of course it's more than that. Um, then you multiply that by country. So uh, I've now actually sold books in 71 countries, um, all of those in English. I do have some books in other languages, but 71 countries with books in English. This is possible now as a self-publisher. And then multiply that by language. And you can already see the potential for multiple streams of income with the more books you have. So self-publishing success as defined by reaching readers can now be done incredibly effectively in all of these different ways. Um, audiobooks, for example, have really only opened up in the last couple of years. Very, very exciting. And uh, we're seeing new markets uh, opening every day to the growth of ebook sales. Oh, and this is my little map from Kobo, <laughs> which I love. It, it maps all the countries where people have bought your books. And uh, so I thought I'd put that there and show you. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the cell phone, people reading on their cell phones. I read on my um, iPhone. Um, iBooks is in 51 countries. It's the, I think it's the number one phone in China. You know, people all over the world 
are now reading on their phones and uh, also in their cars. So 2016, um, Google Auto and Apple CarPlay have now got streaming audio in cars. So WhisperSync with Kindle where people can start reading and then carry on listening or stream audio directly from Audible. Uh, all these mean that the markets for your book are just getting wider and wider and wider every day. So I kind of want you to think beyond the bookstore, you know, beyond the bookstore at the end of your road or in your town to look where you could be with uh, successful self-publishing, which is super exciting. However, I did want to put a caveat on this because if you do only have one book or you have less than three books, uh, then starting out with KDP Select is possibly a good idea. And I'm just going to link to that um, there, um, you know, about exclusivity. There's lots of pros and cons of KDP Select. If you don't know what that is, uh, you can Google that later. Um, but essentially, it's you, you have to be exclusive to Amazon. So I think sometimes it's good to start out small when you're self-publishing. But over time, remember that your global sales map can look something like this. So it's um, it's a pretty exciting world out there. And uh, as I said, your definition of success will change over time. So that was a sort of whistle stop tour through seven uh, different uh, tips, I guess, and ways to help you successfully self-publish. But really, it's down to you and you choosing what you want to achieve and then uh, like going for it in 2016 and of course when this webinar is over uh, write down what you will do in the next 90 days towards your goal and uh, I hope there's been some interesting things for you here this evening are you still there Joel man you really packed a ton of stuff in uh, 45 minutes Joanna that was amazing yes I'm here my fingers are a little tired because I've been answering questions like crazy uh, yeah, sorry about that. Because, <laughs> look, this presentation, I mean, I was learning stuff too. I mean, all the stuff about how to deal with categories and keywords is so important on Amazon and, and really in any other kind of search engine oriented uh, retail site. So that is fantastic. We're going to get back to more of those questions. But uh, why don't you flip over to the next slide there, Joanna? Um, you know, you can see that Joanna has extracted this information from her own incredible experience over the last uh, years. I don't know how many years it's been. When did you uh, actually start your new publishing after you set up the Creative Pen? 2008. Okay, so it's we just broke into 2016. So this is about seven years worth of uh, on the ground, uh, you know, we shoulder to the grindstone kind of experience. And you know, Joanna gets asked these questions all the time because she's been very successful at building her platform and selling books. And as you can tell, she's going to be selling a lot of books in the future, too. And uh, I'm personally going to throw a party for her when she hits that one million book mark. <laughs> uh, anyway, to help other authors trying to navigate this journey, uh, Joanna has put together a really terrific course on how to do self-publishing. Now you can see there is a huge amount you need to know behind even this 45 minute presentation, like all of that stuff about where to put the books. I've got questions stacked up here about good sites to promote on, how many words you should write. And, and this is exactly what Joanna put into this self-publishing success course. Now I have the course. Uh, I was lucky I got in uh, early in advance of this webinar and in the course, Joanna goes over all of this content and shows you exactly how she got all the results that she's been talking about today. Why don't we flip over again there, Joanna? I know you got another one there. <clears throat> okay. Uh, yeah, there it is. So what is it that's in the course? And this is a video course. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute, what it looks like. But it covers all of these topics. Like every author, uh, I think, should really be considering seriously publishing ebooks uh, as well as print books. Now, you may want to hold off on the print book if you're publishing, uh, you know, you're a new fiction writer. You might not know what your readers want yet. And I had some questions about that in the question box. Do they want ebooks? Do they want print books? Do they want audio books? Well, just like Joanna was talking about when she started her first series, 
At that point, she didn't know. It was the information gained from actual experience that taught her what her readers wanted. Uh, and she covers all of this process of publishing ebooks, print books, audio books. And then we get into some really important stuff because it's great and it's a lot of fun publishing books. Look, I've been doing it most of my life. I love it. But, you know, selling them, that's a little harder. <laughs> that's when the real work starts. And anybody who's getting ready to publish or not getting the kind of results you think you should be getting from the work you put in, you really owe it to yourself to check this stuff out because, you know, Joanna is somebody I go to as my, uh, you know, my authoritative source about what's going on right now. What are the latest programs? Uh, what's the best strategy for fiction authors and nonfiction authors? And how can we actually help you get something back? You know, getting uh, praise from readers is great. Getting paid is also pretty great, let me tell you. It gives you a lot of positive reinforcement to keep going because, you know, you might be sitting uh, in a dark room for months writing your book, but you want to get some positive response from the market. That's super important. So what Joanne has done is she's created uh, these lessons. Uh, there, You can see that she has a very personable style of teaching. Um, here's what it looks like when you get into the course. You'll see down the left there are all the lessons in the course, you know, uh, all the how-to and the marketing segments. And you can see that uh, I'm right in the middle of watching one of the uh, Let's Get Publishing videos. And one of the reasons I asked Joanna to put this slide in is because you can see her right in the video. And I think this is a great idea. I actually love that when I'm going through these lessons that Joanna is sitting there talking to me, just like we were sitting having a cup of coffee and I asked her a question and she's now going to answer that question in detail. Uh, the other, and, and I just love that. You know, too often we get these uh, slides like on this webinar. I like to make contact with that person. So um, the other thing about the course is that Joanna's provided all of the information, both as videos, audios, and um, transcripts. So you can, um, well, slides actually. So you can actually consume the content any way you like. And I really appreciate that. I know many courses I take, and I am a uh, a glutton for these courses. You know, sometimes people ask me, well, how'd you get your blog so big? And how do you get all these people on these calls? And hey, I study this stuff. I study with people I respect. And uh, the way I love to take in this content the best is by audio. I can listen when I'm on, uh, when I'm exercising, I can listen to my car. It's really ideal for content consumption. That's another reason why I'm a big fan of Joanna's podcast. So Joanna's taken all the results, uh, the experience she gained publishing both fiction, nonfiction, series, freebies, Amazon, BN, selling all over the world, getting her books translated and put it into this course to cut down on your frustration and research time and wondering whether you're going to get the right results. So the, the course is really great if you're new to self-publishing. It really will give you a really comprehensive overview of what the process is about and how authors go about actualizing this. Um, maybe, like I said before, you've tried it. You've put a book or two out there and it's just not happening for you. I hate when that happens. I want to see people get a really positive response. Now, in my world, I'm not really very concerned about whether, you know, about how many copies people sell. I talk to the authors and I say, well, what would make you feel like this was a successful journey for you? And sometimes people want to sell, you know, a bazillion copies. Sometimes people are just looking to sell to a particular segment of the market. Sometimes people aren't that interested in the money at all. They're like have a message they want to send the world. They have an innovation. They have a new idea. They have a process that's better than anything else that's out there. Um, so it doesn't matter what your motivation is. I want to see you get some success. Uh, we also have a lot of traditionally published authors now who have gotten the rights to their older books back or they've maintained their digital rights. So the book maybe came out 10 years ago as a print book. 
but they never negotiated for the ebook rights, so they have the ebook rights. So all these traditional authors, I hear from these people almost every day, and they're kind of mystified by the self-publishing process, but they know that that represents a huge potential for them. And uh, so this course will also help them out as well. Now, obviously, Joanna and I both have pretty much the same ethic on things. We want you to be happy and get real value from the things that we do. If you don't, if you're not happy or you think you didn't get the value, you know, we're going to stand behind our products. And Joanna has put a, a complete satisfaction guarantee on this course. If you get in there, you don't like it, you know, you can get your money back. It's as simple as that. I think we got another slide, Joanna. And I'm really impressed that we're doing this on time. You know, it's not one of my strengths. I frequently run over, but uh, I'm really glad that we're doing that. So uh, there we go. Now, this course costs $297, and it's worth every single penny. But, you know, uh, because of this promotion we put together, uh, we decided to make this an even better offer for you. I think it was pretty pretty dynamite at 297 to be honest. I would buy it in a minute because I don't really have the time to spend researching all the stuff that's in this course. And you know, due to the value of my time, it would save me $300, you know, probably within the first week. But Joanna has really generously taken 100 bucks off the price. That's a 34% discount. And uh, if you're interested in this and you think it would help you, while this special promotion is going on, you can get it for $197, which if you asked me, I would tell you it was freaking awesome. But, you know, I thought there is more I can do. Joanna's put all her experience into her course, and I'm helping her promote it here. But, you know, I love talking to authors and helping them solve problems and get on the right path also. So here, I've never made this offer before. And who knows what happens? I may never make it again. <laughs> but I am offering anybody who buys Joanna's course during this promotion, and this will run until Sunday at midnight, I will offer you a 30-minute one-on-one coaching session on any topic you choose. I have two uh, rules for that. One is I would like you to go through the course first. And the reason for that is I don't want you asking me questions that Joanne has already answered. And if you buy the course, you could just get them by going through the course. And you really want to go through this course. Trust me, I don't care how many books you've published. You're going to learn a ton. Uh, the other requirement is that you would need to uh, schedule your talk one, within one year from the date you purchased the course. I don't think that's too onerous. Onerous was my word of the day today. That means painful or unpleasant. Uh, so that's the offer. In other words, you can get Joanna's complete course on self-publishing success, showing you exactly how she's achieved bestseller status, sold over 400,000 books all over the world, and she, she's going to give it to you for $197. So if you've got an ebook and you're making a $2 profit on your ebook, your royalty is two bucks, which is about what you get for a $2.99 retail uh, Kindle ebook, you would have to sell less than 100 books to pay for this course. Now, I am just going to tell you that I don't think there's any chance that somebody with a, a decent book uh, out in the market going through this course isn't going to sell 100 extra copies from the information in the course. It's just impossible. So this is the deal. You can get the course. You can get my 30-minute one-on-one consultation. You pick the topic. You want me to look at your blog. You want me to look at your cover. You want me to look at your book design. You want me to suggest some fonts. I don't care. You can ask me any publishing question you want, and it's $197. Uh, there's the URL. You can see it right there. It's thebookdesigner.com slash Joanna. Pretty creative, huh? And uh, I will put that into the uh, question box so you can just click the link. But come on, it's not that hard to type that. And um, what we want to do now is, um, I think we got one more slide, don't we, Joanna? 
we want to switch over to the um, questions. Okay, great. So can you hear me okay, Joanna? Yeah, all good. And uh, yeah, I can see there's a gazillion questions. So um, oh, man. I'll just let you pick them. <laughs> we're going to try. Look, I'm from New York and Joanna is from London. We're going to, we both talk kind of fast. So we're going to try and get through as many of these as possible in the next 15 minutes. So um, you want me to give you these questions, Joanna? Are you ready? Yeah. All right. Well, here's a question from Christy. She wants to know if you format your own books. Mm. I do my own formatting for um, my eBooks using Scrivener software, which is the best $45 you'll ever spend uh, writing software and formatting software. However, I do um, I recommend Joel's book design templates for print, uh, or I do also for my more complicated print. Um, I hire somebody to format for print, so you can do that yourself as well. Um, but uh, certainly, eBook formatting I always do myself. Here's a really interesting question from uh, Bradley Charbonneau. Hi, Bradley. Uh, he says he loves your series page on Amazon and wants to know how you built up series page. How do you do that? So there's a field when you publish, and it's on all the platforms now. It's a series title field, and you have to populate it with exactly the same content. And this is don't so don't call your series something complicated with like dashes and uh, you know it's, uh, other things. Make it as, as easy as possible, and then Amazon actually automatically link series together, um, as do iBooks now. Um, so just you know with Kobo you can click on a series. So the the series linking is something that's become Becoming more and more important, and as you can see on Amazon now, they or they have this thing on your Kindle that says, "Oh, here's some more in the series, and you own two out of the five or whatever." So it is incredibly powerful, and uh, you know that is another reason that you want to do series because Amazon essentially markets the series for you. So uh, that should just happen once you use the series linking field. Yeah, and uh, there was also a question about. A series for nonfiction, whether that was also effective, and and I just wanted to mention that yes, if you're if all the books are intended for the same market, a series a nonfiction series can be great also because just yes. like with a fiction series, people read one, they're going to go looking for the other ones. Yeah, exactly. So you could say, you know, for Steve Scott, Habits, the Habits series, for example, and that will link books. They don't have to be, um, you know, sequential like fiction, um, but as long as they're related, you can still use exactly the same field to link books together. Now, here's an interesting one. We've talked about series a lot on this call, and this is from DF. If you're testing the waters and self-publishing for the first time, how do you know it's cost effective to start a series? Shouldn't you wait until after you've published the first book? Well, it's just very, very, very hard to sell one book. <laughs> and if you have three books, as I mentioned, um, they could be three novellas, for example, but if you put the first one on perma-free and promote that first one, that will get you traffic in the door, and it will be much, much, much easier to get people you know, interested than just one book. I mean, again, think about your own reading habits. Um, when you find someone who has a series, do you not just jump on them like a crazy person and go through their entire backlist? Um, and this is, that tends to be what happens. Um, so if you have one book, of course, you do, and I remember feeling this, it's like, oh, you know, it takes so long when you're first starting out, but it's also incredibly hard to sell one book, and it gets easier to sell books the more books you have, and certainly in a series. Now, I've tried multiple, uh, I have two series, I have one standalone book, Risen Gods, and that was always written as a standalone, so um, as a co-written book. So. That, uh, that does fit into your model there of just one book, but I know that that book will never sell as many as it would have done if I had had more than one book in that series. Just because of this culture we're in now with this kind of binge, binge content uh, devouring. Okay, there's a bunch of questions here, Joanna, about international sales. Like, for instance, uh, one person wrote and said, you know, she published in the U.S. How do you actually get started publishing in other countries? How do you? How do, what are the steps that you do to do that? And I bet that's covered in your course, isn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. But the, the main thing is that when you actually self-publish, um, you can select the countries that you want the book to be available in. So Amazon, of course, is available in lots of countries. Kobo is available in like 150 countries. Um, you know, people can buy, uh, people have these various sites in the countries where they are. Um, now, the, the books that appear on those sites will be different because traditional publishers sell books by uh, territory. Now, this gives indies a a real advantage in territories outside the norm. Uh, for example, I know of people in New Zealand who sell their rights um, in New Zealand but haven't sold the rights in the US. So you should definitely, if you're in a country that is not America and you haven't sold your American rights, you should definitely get your books up there. And all you have to do when you go into the self-publishing platform is if you own all your rights, so if you're self-publishing for the first time, you just click all worldwide and your book will be automatically available in all these countries and if you have sold some rights then you just uh, make sure those um, countries are not checked and only publish in the countries you do own the rights for. Now then the other question becomes well how do uh, readers even find you in these other countries and I would say just think about everything you do online now like my podcast people listen to from all over the world every tweet everything on Facebook every you know Pinterest board uh, every Instagram photo can be found by anyone online and it's super surprising um, how people do find stuff so I have never really changed my um, marketing strategy to sell to people in 71 countries it's just happened and also I know it's happened because um, you know with a with Kobo with iBooks for example there are fewer books in Malaysia or you know uh, the Czech Republic and so you end up making sales in in unexpected places because they have uh, less choice so it's, it's a very bright time for international sales and we are barely getting started oh absolutely Absolutely, that's for sure. Now, here's an update from Suzanne Lakin. Hi, Suzanne. Uh, and she says that Amazon has now taken away the series link. And uh, they told her they may bring it back. Uh, so, you know, that's the problem with self-publishing, I find. You know, all of these platforms, if you focus on, you know, um, you know, uh, one particular thing uh, on Amazon or, you know, or, or Apple or anywhere else, you know, this stuff changes constantly. So all those articles people wrote like a year ago or two years ago about how to use Kindle Select, they, they could all be obsolete now. This stuff just keeps <laughs> changing all the time. So that's, uh, thanks, Suzanne, for uh, putting that in. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that thing about things changing, um, it's definitely true. And what's great, again, an advantage of being an indie is you can be flexible and agile and respond to the market. So the minute something changes, the word goes around on the indie grapevine and um, we adapt. Uh, so yeah, and also remember the Amazon beta test all the time. They change things all the time. So um, the last time I looked, that that series for for my series was still there. But again, it changes, um, for, you know, from time to time. So, uh, but you know, if you keep up with following people through Twitter and on the blogs and things, you'll find out what changes. And of course, in terms of the course, I will update uh, significant stuff over time. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about uh, online training. I mean, I love books. I love reading them. I love owning them. I love publishing them. Hey, when I'm finished with them, I love recycling them. But, you know, the fact is it's really hard to update books as things change very fast. And an online course can be much more easily updated and kept up to date than like a huge book on self-publishing. And um, here's a question from uh, Gren Gale, uh, wondering what you kind of budget for editing and proofreading? Yeah, so I would say, again, your first book is going to be the most expensive in terms of editing, in my opinion, because you're actually learning how to write a book. Um, so I would absolutely recommend at the beginning, you might look at a structural edit, which is um, you get a, a kind of report, and then you might want a line edit, which is actually the red, you know, the classic red pen, and then uh, I always hire a proofreader as well before I publish. So I have uh, I have two uh, editors for fiction and uh, one for non-fiction, entirely separate. And at this point, I budget between 500 and 2,000 US dollars for my uh, for a full-length book, for a full 
content edit, line edit, and you know, a couple of hundred dollars for a proofread. Now, you, I have, I think editing is a bit like uh, getting an editor is a bit like dating. You don't find the best editor in your first, uh, the first time around. <laughs> so I've tried a, a number of different editors too. But having a good editor makes a huge difference. You just have to look for them. And um, I have a ton of uh, editing. Um, articles and links to editors at thecreativepen.com forward slash editors. So that might help because it's a question I get all the time. Um, but certainly if, if you don't have a bigger budget as that, um, you can do bartering with other authors in the genre. Make sure anybody who reads it is a fan of the genre or the type of book you're writing because you do not want to give a romance to a horror fan, for example. <laughs> it just will not work. So, um, you can, th so there's definitely pros and cons, but um, I think getting a professional edit along with a professional book cover are kind of my two really, really really try and budget for these things because they make such a difference. And if you want to do this long term, every single edit you will learn more about how to be a better writer. And that is an important part of the journey. So the editor isn't just editing your manuscript, they're kind of teaching you about writing at the same time. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and I actually think it's the best way to learn. Like, it's better to have someone critique your words than it is to read a book on writing a novel. And let's face it, everyone on the line has hundreds of books on writing books. <laughs> but actually having somebody critique it and, you know, a paid professional, not your mum, you know, is a good idea. Excellent. Now, one person uh, wanted to know whether uh, when people who take the course, Joanna, is there an opportunity for them to ask questions? Uh, because this, um, I mean, I, we have a support email. Um, so support at the Creative Pen, people can ask questions. But because it's uh, like a quite a, uh, a full course, I guess, it should answer all your questions. But you can certainly always email me um, and I answer the, the support email along with um, uh, several other people. So definitely you can ask questions that way. That's great. Um, and here's another one that reminds us how things keep changing, Joanna. This is from Rose. She says, I've heard of a new self-publishing platform called Pronoun. Is this something you'd recommend and try yourself, or would you stick to the Smashwords Amazon combination? Uh, I believe Pronoun is what used to be called Vook, which uh, you might remember, Joel, from years ago. They've yeah. had a few yeah. incarnations. Um, the, and I believe they are free to self-publish, same as everything else. So what you have to do when you uh, use a distributor, I, I haven't used them myself, so I can't really question, but when you use a distributor, you have to look at where, how do they make their money. That's super important. So for example, Smashwords draft a digital uh, take uh, 10 to 15 percent, maybe 20 percent for some things um, off your um, off your profit. Uh, if you go direct, so if you go to Amazon, Kobe Writing Life, um, iTunes, etc., um, iBooks, you you just get um, the the seventy percent royalty, for example. Um, so when you use any kind of distributor, Pronoun would be one. Um, there's a new one called Publish Direct. Uh, there's more and more of these every single day. <laughs> um, is look at how they make their money and also their long term projection in terms of once you start publishing through these platforms, it becomes very difficult to unpublish on those platforms without losing your reviews. And you can be trapped into something that might cost you money. So I really, really like um, sites that will just take a cut of your sales. So Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, draft digital Smashwords, they, they only get paid when you get paid. Um, anyone you have to pay to make a change to your manuscript or um, is unclear about how they how they make their money. That um, it, you know makes me go, uh, what is going on here? Because we're all businesses, we have to make money somehow. So that would be my blanket recommendation. Also, check out choosing a self-publishing service by the Alliance of Independent Authors, which is on the ebook stores, and that will help you. Um, it has a whole list of questions in to look at how to use different self-publishing platforms and or print companies, for example, around rights, um, you know, lots of different things to consider if you're using a, a third party company, essentially. So that's choosing a self-publishing service available on uh, all the ebook stores. Excellent. 
You know, there seem to be a lot of people who've uh, taken your advice and are deep into series writing, Joanna, and uh, there's a bunch of questions. Uh, here's one, for instance. This is from Lorna. The second book in my series will be too big to make a profit at CreateSpace. I'll owe them money with every copy I sell. Yeah, that's not a good result, Lorna. Uh, will the market <laughs> bear a price of $9.99 or higher? Or should I go back to the bad old days of a print run and office full of boxes? No, do not go Don't back to it. the bad old days. No boxes of books. <laughs> <laughs> no, please no. Um, all as I said, I mean, I lost so much. That was that was my massive mistake, and where I lost loads of money. Um, no, seriously, my print books are twelve ninety nine, thirteen ninety nine. You mustn't equate your print on demand price with the price in a physical bookstore, especially if you're in the UK, where it's three books for a fiver. You know, in in most bookstores, that's not the way it works. And um, the one reason to do a print book is for hardcore fans, obviously, but most indie authors make 90% of their income from ebook sales. Um, I think mine's about 84% now with print being 7 and audio being 7. So or something like that. My math is <laughs> falling apart. Um, but essentially I would say that you, you, I don't think you actually can um, pay create space as in I think you have to price over the print cost. Um, so yeah. that's definitely a way to go. If you use Ingram Spark, you can definitely be out of pocket. Mm -hmm. But um, with CreateSpace, I always just um, take the cost and then add on two dollars. The other thing I might suggest is splitting your book into two. If it's a long print book, then it's also a long ebook, so you could potentially s split that. But also, Joel would know about this. There are ways you can change the font and change the layout, which will impact the um, size of the book. Or um, if you change from a 5 by 8 to a 6 by 9 and you know change the font, you can actually quite dramatically impact um, the size, the print size. But that would be, uh, there'd be things about that on Joel's website for sure. Yeah, and that is where, you know, if if you're really doing this and you're planning on trying to make a business out of it, this is where you really should start thinking about maybe hiring somebody. I've had these books uh, in my practice often. I've had I had a 277,000 word memoir. I mean, that's that's pretty tough to fit that into one book and actually be able to sell at a reasonable price. But you know, book designers have lots of tricks and they have more fonts than you've ever seen. So uh, I was able to actually get that book into about 548 pages and it was very, very readable. It looked beautiful. So, uh, you know, I think that really paid for itself uh, in terms of cutting the production cost of the book because in print on demand, we get charged by the page. And uh, so something to think about, you know, you might uh, you might want to do that. Or also, I actually designed um, a template for people with very long books because this comes up over and over again. So we designed one. It's called Pulp, and it's specifically a high density uh, template if you're working in Microsoft Word uh, that will allow you to get a lot more words per page and still have a beautiful looking book. So you might want to check that out. Okay, um, this was an interesting question, also kind of on the series uh, theme, and this is from uh, Bowie. Bowie says, uh, if you're writing nonfiction series and you think you've written a really great book, should you s start with non-essential books to gain market advantage? And I, I think what's behind this question is that Bowie doesn't want to put his great book out free, so he's going to create some books that aren't quite as great, I think. Mm. <laughs> <Make them free. laughs> I, uh, I would suggest that. The implication is there, but what do you think? Yeah, I think they should always be great, but um, you can do uh, different versions, I guess. So I have my kind of magnum opus is uh, Business for Authors, How to Be an Author Entrepreneur. Now, that is a seriously chunky book, which I also recorded in audiobook for people who are very serious about making, you know, actually running a business. And then what I discovered was the number of people who want that magnum opus are quite small. So what I did was I took um, the kind of more commercial aspects of it and I made a much smaller book which is how to make a living with your writing better title um, but similar 
um, information, but um, also a lot cheaper. Uh, and that made uh, Inc.com's, you know, one of the top 100 nonfiction books last year, which I was like, wow, that's interesting. So that's a good example of where you put your mega, mega best information in your magnum opus. And um, I'm a speaker as well, and I also believe that. Uh, you have different target audiences for different versions of your book. So um, if you've got business for authors, you don't need how to make a living with your writing. But um, it was just kind of that I wanted to offer a smaller version, a more commercial version, um, a sort of light version. So I hope that helps. I mean, but I actually wrote the big one first. Um, and for example, how to market a book is another one of mine. Again, very chunky. Um, uh, yeah. So. I would say that don't never, never, never save your um, creativity. I fully believe that creativity is like a pipe, and it just keeps going. So if you empty yourself, and all of us do this, you empty yourself onto the page with your book, um, you will find you then have a bit of a rest. You will find that you get inspiration for the next book. So never be afraid to give everything you've got to the book that you're writing. I love that you said that. Thank you. Uh, here's a couple of questions from Barry. Uh, one is about, uh, have you looked at Grammarly, which is becoming more popular every day, I think, which is a grammar site that helps you uh, correct your grammar. And also, Barry wants to know how you can tell how many books are being sold on Amazon. Yeah, sure. So Grammarly, uh, my husband has the plugin on his um on his browser, so all his emails go through Grammarly and all that. Um, I don't use it myself. Um, I think it's great as a tool for yourself, but um, an editor does more than correct your grammar. So if it's a case of can you replace an editor with Grammarly, I don't believe you can because an editor is not about grammar. I mean, part of their job is, but but there's a much bigger job around um, content structure issues with if it's fiction the plot and the characters and you know it's a much bigger story architect um, I, a job than a just a grammar line by line thing like when I get an edit now my grammar and my spelling is is barely touched I write a very clean draft because I've learned that over time but what I need is help with story arcs and with nonfiction it's kind of a sense check and all of that type of thing so yes I think it's a good tool for your toolbox but it doesn't replace an editor and then in terms of knowing how many sales you make what this is another advantage to being self-published all of the platforms have um, daily reports and they're updated you know um, hourly although over time you know so for example if you run a book promotion on Amazon at 12 noon US Eastern by about five o'clock you're going to get sales reports that show how many books you sold uh, you know around the time of your promotion so this is something that traditionally published authors do not get ever <laughs> pretty much even when they get royalty reports months later they can't um, tie them to a specific day uh, some publishers are changing to try and add these type of portals but it is something that you just get from logging on to the various self-publishing platforms and it will be if not real time it will be you know at least daily beautiful now Joanna we're also getting a couple of questions about children's books I know you mm. as far as I know you don't actually write children's books but uh, for instance we have a question about do children's books sell in Kindle, or do you have to uh, stick to four, a paperback that's for like 8 to 12-year-olds? And someone else wanted to know if you deal with uh, publishing children's books in your course and how to find illustrators. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So um, actually, I've got quite a few uh, children's authors who have done the course. And a lot, a lot of this information is valid regardless of what you write. How to self-publish, the process of self-publishing, um, is pretty much um, the same. However, for children's books specifically, I do uh, mention some resources that I'll mention now. One is um, Kindle eBook uh, Creator for Kids. Oh, sorry, Kindle Kids eBook Creator. I think that's what it's called now, which is specifically for books on the Kindle Fire. If you saw over Christmas, Amazon did a promotion around the kid-proof Kindle Fire, um, which they would um, replace however it got broken. Uh, it didn't matter if it went in the paddling pool or whatever, they'd replace it. So they are actively trying 
trying to get more people um, putting kids' books on Kindle. Um, also, the uh, kids' authors, um, so I guess parents who buy this type of thing, um, actually often buy a print book and a, a digital version because you know kids like uh, reading the same thing over and over again, and maybe they're in the car and you know they grab the iPhone and they can carry on with the book that they were reading at home. Um, so certainly, Kindle uh, Kids ebook creator and uh, iBooks author is the other one. So some people are publishing directly on iBooks author, um, which you can do much more rich rich um, text, you can do audio, video, that type of thing. Um, and there are some publishers now in the US that publish specifically for iBooks and schools that have um, iPads specifically. Uh, the other, I would also direct you at uh, my friend Karen Inglis, I-N-G-L-I-S. Um, Karen has a great site for children's authors and, lo and she has written books for lots of different age groups. So she includes a whole load of information there about self-publishing children's books specifically um, where you can find help on everything from picture books to that um, mid mid-range uh, age, that type of thing. And the other thing I would say about kids' books on marketing, because uh, I get this question all the time, is remember that you are marketing to parents, teachers, grandparents and aunties and uncles people who buy books for kids. Um, so a lot of kids authors get worried about, you know, should they design a website directly for the children and uh, very often you, you should be more targeting mummy blogs, you know, um, the grey blogs, grandparent blogs, that type of thing uh, with your marketing. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, and really, children's books have exploded. I mean, since the self-publishing revolution, and as as the color capabilities of the print-on-demand vendors have gotten better, it's really a huge and growing market. So that that's very cool. Here's an interesting one from Tracy, uh, Joanna. Uh, Tracy wants to know: Can you do a novella series and sell as well as a series of novels? Yeah, definitely. Um, H.M. Ward, I put up there earlier, uh, she has a novella series, um, and I think there's about 25 of them so far, selling at $2.99. So that is the thing to remember, is that if you're doing a novella series, it's not a, a novella series is not a serialized novel, so these are two different things. Uh, each novella has to be a story in itself, a complete story in itself. It can just be shorter. So um, my novella, One Day in Budapest, is an entirely... Uh, you know, on its own book, but it's also number four in a series. Um, a serialized book is you have each one contains a cliffhanger to the next one, so that you have to buy them all. And they they seem to be less popular, but certainly a novella series you can do um, uh, with fiction or non-fiction, um, where they just you just have shorter books. The main thing is to consider what is the value to the reader and price accordingly. So I price my novellas at two dollars ninety nine US. Um, because that's the lowest I can go on Amazon with the 70% royalty. Um, whereas my full length books I price at $4.99 um, because they're full length. Um, I would say that people, when I, with my novellas, if you just write novellas it's probably fine, but because I write full length as well as novellas I sometimes get comments like, uh, this book isn't long enough <laughs> on a novella because people want more, like a lot, a lot of the times people want more. So if you're going to do that just make it very clear that this is a novella or this is a short book. Um, and I put that, I've got, um, you know, I have a book which is called Successful Self-Publishing that's free on all the ebook stores and it says this short book very clearly so that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's free, people don't feel like um, you know it's them. It's meant to be longer, so just make sure the reader knows what they're getting. Yeah, and, and I think that's also a really good point, Joanna, about free books. I mean, I have a short ebook I give away for free on my website in exchange for people's email address if they're interested in learning more about the kind of stuff I do. But the fact of the matter is, I don't just say, "Well, here's an ebook. Sign up if you want it." No, I actually send people to a whole page where I'm selling the free ebook. I'm telling people all the reasons why they might get something out of it, different things that are covered in the book, typical sales copy, even though there's no price. It's free. But, you know, mm. people, are, people are moving fast. They have a lot of stuff coming at them. They don't instantly understand everything behind your offer. It's far better to explain explain it to people, to be transparent, like Joanna is saying, to tell them exactly what they're going to get, and you will have a better response. Now, here's a question yeah, on a topic sorry. that you've thought about a lot, Joanna, and I know that for a fact. 
And this is from Alex, and she says, I know Joanna uses a different name for her nonfiction and her fiction books, but I also know it's good to have as many books as possible out. I'd love to hear her opinion about using the same name for all books, even if the books themselves are very different. So Joel's laughing because he remembers when I put out my first two books under Joanna Penn. So, so I actually started with the same name. And then what happened really was I realized that the target audience for my fiction, uh, say readers of Dan Brown or Stephen King or um, you know that type of book, John Connolly, they are very different to people who listen to my podcast, to the people on this call, to um, the people who want how to market a book. And I think that is the key. So how different are your audiences? So obviously, if you write erotica books and books for children, you have to have two different names. You cannot use the same name for those two different types. Everything else becomes a bit of a gray area. But I know that my readers do not care how to market a book, and I don't want to muddle the waters of JF Penn um, with books on marketing or entrepreneurship, uh, they're also quite different look and feel, so my websites are quite different. So you, you've got Joanna Penn here this evening, you know, happy and bubbly and helpful. Um, JF Penn is quite dark and, um, you know, tends to sort of go in her writing hole and likes to travel and, um, you know, it, it's quite different. Um, so I think you can look at who are the target markets and do you want more than one name. It is a lot more hard work. So yes, I have two websites. I have to have two Facebook pages, two email lists. Um, it, you know, there's no cross fertilization across the books. Or you know, there's probably about 10%, five to 10% for me because you know some of you might go on and look, check out Stone of Fire, for example. Um, but it's it's a very small crossover percentage. Whereas if you write say um, crime and and thrillers and horror and paranormal, um, even you know romantic suspense, you could um, put that all under one name. I interviewed um, Elle Casey, uh, who will be on my podcast soon. She's an amazing, prolific author who writes across multiple genres. She uses the one name, Elle Casey. She writes romance, science fiction, action adventure, you know, lots of different things, but they all share her voice as a, an author, like a, you know, a certain voice that her readers like, even even though they might not follow her to a hardcore sci-fi book after a romance. So I think um, branding your series, so if you're writing in the same name, different genres, then make sure your series look different and, uh, and are very clear, but as we discussed earlier, make it clear what the reader will be getting by the cover and then um, hopefully you won't put people off too much. <laughs> hopefully that helps. Beautiful. Now, before we get to the last question, because we're just about out of time, uh, there were a lot of questions about things that were in the course, what's not in the course. I would highly recommend anybody who's interested or wants to learn more about how Joanna has achieved the kind of success she has and how you can do that too, hit that link, thebookdesigner.com slash Joanna. And go over there on the sales page. She explains everything that's in the course, how it works. There's a huge amount of detail there. It'll tell you everything you want to know. And look, this is not a risky thing. I mean, uh, Joanna's cut the price uh, substantially. Uh, she's guaranteed it. Uh, it's a, you know, a full guarantee, 100% money back guarantee if you're not happy. And look, you know, I charge a lot of money for my consulting time because I've been doing this a long time, longer than seven years. I'm not going to tell you how long, but a multiple. Anyway, a half hour consult with me costs $175. So what I'm offering you today is Joanna's $300 course plus a half hour consultation with me, all for $197. I think that's a pretty great deal if you're interested in really being successful at self-publishing. So go over there, check out the course, but you know, don't wait too long. This offer will disappear. Uh, it'll evaporate on Sunday night, and then it won't be available anymore. So uh, if you're short on funds, look, I, I think it's worth the, 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 the chance. Get the course, look through it. I'm, I'm going to bet that you're going to be able to sell enough books to pay for the course and a whole lot more. Uh, and the last question, uh, Cindy wanted to know if you're ever going to do a self-publishing course for advanced students. What do you think, Joanna? 
<laughs> I actually I have an advanced course. It's called Creative Freedom, and that has a Facebook community and is much more extensive. Um, and it, it, the people who buy, um, who are inside the self-publishing success, um, actually get a promo code um, that will take the price off. Um, creative freedom. So basically, this is step one, and then um, creative freedom, uh, creativefreedomcourse.com uh, has the information on creative freedom. But um, with this deal, you can essentially kind of get both if you know what I mean. Because if you're interested in that advanced, then um, this is like the step one, and then creative freedom is step two. So yes, that is available, um, absolutely. And I should say that um, you can email support at thecreativepen.com with any other questions you have. Um, and uh, of course, it's quite late here in the UK, so if I don't get back to you today, if you're somewhere else in the world, then um, we'll get back to you uh, tomorrow. So certainly, and uh, will you be sending me any other, uh, other people's questions, Joel? Because I'm happy to answer anything by email. I'm going to send you the questions from uh, GoToWebinar, and you will see that many of them have been answered during the course of the, uh, either by you or by me during the course of the webinar, and there are likely going to be a few that haven't been answered. So I will send you all of those. What time is it in London right now? It is half past 10 in the evening. Well, <laughs> we better let you go. I think it's interesting that you do have the uh, the advanced course, uh, you see people, Joanna has thought of everything. She's taking care of you. And both Joanna and I would love to see you have a big success with your books. I mean, that's why we do this stuff, basically. So yeah. I want to thank everyone from taking time out of your day to come to this uh, presentation today. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot myself. And uh, go over and check out the the uh, self-publishing success course at thebookdesigner.com slash Joanna while the promotion's going on. And uh, go out there and publish some great books. And thanks to everyone for coming. Yeah, Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joel. Bye.